Okay, I'm gonna get started. Hello, my name is Brad Gieseman. Welcome to Hacking and Hardening Kubernetes by Example. <clears throat> uh, if you wanna grab the slide link here, it's the first one. Uh, and then the GitHub repo that all the demos are being run out of, it's in a separate window for me. You can also run those two in front of you if you're far back and not able to see the text if it's going by a little bit too quickly. I have to apologize that I have to go through it so quickly because I have so much to show and I wanna show it to you. So this is more of a, of an index, so to speak. You can go back and then dive in deep um, as you're at your leisure. <clears throat> a little bit about me. Uh, formerly a penetration tester consultant uh, in the last five or six years uh, using the cloud almost exclusively, uh, designing ethical hacking simulations or capture the flag exercises. And in the past year, uh, we've been running, at my former company, we've been running capture the flag exercises on top of Kubernetes inside AWS. If that sounds crazy, it is a little bit, um, but we worked very hard to make sure that was a success. And in the past few months, I uh, spent a lot of time looking at as many clusters as I could, researching Kubernetes security and policy. And so that body of research, that work, is what I want to share with you today. So over the past five months, I've installed a few clusters. I've dreamt that I was installing a cluster while I was asleep. It was very surreal. <laughs> um, <clears throat> by a show of hands, who has a cluster that's listed here, or an installer, or uses an installer that's listed here with one of those versions or similar to that? Okay, a fair number of you. Welcome. Um, how many of you run your own distro? You're, you rolled your own? Brave souls, awesome. It'll still apply to you, I promise. The biggest takeaway from a security perspective for me is looking at all of these installation mechanisms that the thing that stood out was a malicious user with a shell, by default, I'm saying default on purpose, can very possibly and almost very likely exfiltrate source code, keys, tokens, credentials, elevate their privilege inside the cluster from a non-privileged state to a privileged state inside of Kubernetes, uh, which often then leads to root access on the underlying nodes. And I think bullet point number four is probably the most interesting or, or something that hasn't been talked about as much, uh, really expand the blast radius to your entire cloud account in some situations. So I hope to be able to get to that quick enough to be able to cover that in its, it, in its entirety. The goals of this talk, I want to raise awareness of those high-risk attacks in as many installers or distributions as possible so that everyone has that knowledge. Uh, demonstrate the attacks live. Uh, I'm not brave enough to type uh, live, and I don't type quickly enough live, so these are recorded uh, typing sessions, um, which then that offers you the ability to have at home and, and look at and examine. Finally, I want to provide some hardening methods for those specific attacks, and then additional guidance that goes a few more steps uh, beyond that. So like Morpheus, I'm beginning to believe, I'm beginning to believe that high system complexity means for users who are new to the, to the a project that getting it to work from an operator's perspective, getting it to work is hard enough. You know, it's such a, a wide range of new terminology, tools, mechanisms that most people use the defaults the first time through, right? So I'm, look, they probably know better than me. I'm just going to accept the defaults. Let's go see how it works. But defaults tend to have inertia. So defaults in use early tend to stay in use, and system, systems hardened late tend to break. And that's kind of, um, as I was going through all the clusters, that was, that was what I was doing. So I was running into it left and right. So my belief is that having default values be secure early on, in terms of a project or how you're distributing your, your, your project in source code, has positive downstream effects to the community. And when something like Kubernetes literally blows up, has widespread adoption, uh, that inertia is big and it's real. And what that kind of leads us into is a, I call it a security capability gap. I, I struggle with a name for what this is, but basically the community at large is somewhat behind the major dot releases as they're coming out. So maybe you're between 1.5 and 1.7. Um, most mortals, uh, you know, can't literally deploy ever, overnight a brand new Kubernetes release. But most uh, installers um, and containers of service offerings are keeping up, right? But the trick is, is that security capabilities and features are coming in newer releases. So if you're still on 1.5 and 1.6, RBAC is really rough for you. But if you're in 1.7 and 1.8, it's been baked in, it's been battle tested and things like that. So it's tough because you have to keep up with those ever fast moving releases. Um, and so it, it's up to you to add additional security hardening. If you're on 1.6 and 1.7, 
don't despair. Uh, it just needs a lot of elbow grease. And the things I want to talk about today are not uh, extreme in-depth esoteric attacks, kernel level exploits and things. I'm talking about low hanging fruit. I believe I found enough of it to share with you and that's enough for uh, a start, right? I want to raise the bar, um, just doing the basic image safety, RBAC, network isolation, uh, just doing those things and enforcing those basic controls that are already there, already existing inside clusters. So when you go to harden some clusters, what, what are some of the challenges? Well, a lot of folks like to use DISA-STIG or CIS benchmarks as a, a way to say, what's the security posture of my cluster? Well, at the operating system level, uh, those specific benchmarks don't take into account the workload that's running on them. They say, you know, is that the password? And that's the uh, group, are those properly uh, set with permissions? But it doesn't know anything about Kubernetes. And conversely, if you're doing a CIS Kubernetes benchmark, it's not taking into consideration the OS, but it's not also taking into consideration how the installer places things and where it puts it and where it grabs it from, from the cloud provider. So basically, properly hardening your Kubernetes cluster is highly dependent on your environment, your add-ons, your plugins, and the defaults are very often not enough. There's a lot of knobs you have to tweak, and we're gonna go through some of those. Um, something I like to call attack-driven hardening. This is just how I think. It's been built into me as a pen tester. Every time I look at a system, uh, I think this way, and I try to reason about a system in this way in terms of its security posture. And the best way I can summarize it is, and how I think, I think in progressive steps. I say, from where I am, what can I see, do, or access next? I pick one of the most plausible methods, and I say, all right, assume that happened. All right, now what does it look like? What can I see, do, or access next? And I repeat until it's game over, until the worst data is got uh, and extracted. And then I work backwards, and I harden as I go uh, further away. It's basically quick and dirty attack modeling. So everybody here today can take that persona of the external attacker. If you're looking at a cluster, Typically, these are the methods you're thinking of right off the bat. Are you gonna be able to get SSH access to the nodes? Maybe, not likely. Go through the API server? Maybe, not likely. You don't have credentials for either of those. But what about getting a shell on a container inside the cluster? That's where it gets interesting. And the three that I came up with that were right off the bat are exploiting an application running an exposed container. That's hit or miss. Not all apps are extremely vulnerable with a remote code execution. Tricking an admin into running a compromised container. That's, that's interesting. Uh, or compromising a project developer. Uh, compromise their GitHub keys or their Docker registry keys and modifying their project images and binaries. Throughout this research, I did find somebody's credentials in a Git commit by accident. I was just looking at code and I found it and they were, after I reported it to them, they did say it was indeed their company's ability to push to Quay. So, that is a real deal, so protect your keys. So which is easier? I'm gonna pick on number two today, teaching and admin. I've written uh, a couple blog posts, but I've read thousands, and I found something, it's kind of a pattern. Uh, if you say, here's something really complicated, uh, use my custom images, hey, here's my Docker file, everything's on the up and up. In those instructions is what? A kube control create from that URL. Just slam all these pods and services in and then figure it out and see what happens. I like to think kube control create from URL is the new curl in the bash. Because <clears throat> it really is. And it's often worse because now it's distributed across thousands of nodes. I said this was about hacking and hardening. Let's make with the hacking. For the rest of the attack structure, this is my 3D diagram of a sacrificial cluster. In the lower left, you have the master node. In the upper right, you have two workers. Very straightforward, very simplistic. We've got a couple of pods running. Not all are represented here, but just the ones we care about in this case. And we have the metadata API represented as that yellow block up there. So, my handy dandy little attacker icon here, if he's able to exploit the vulnerable app in the default namespace, if they get a shell, can they? install custom tools, and by doing so, prove internet access, which is something that penetration testers always love to have um, when you're trying to pull down your tool sets. Um, can I install curl, netcat, and that? Can I pull down the kube control binary and put it into a place and run it? That's always interesting. Another look at things. 
it's not common anymore, but in 1.4 and 1.5, if you're running 1.4 and 1.5, a lot of the installers back then, or if you rolled your own, you might still have the insecure bind address on your API server. That's a big no-no, uh, because there's no auth authentication or authorization on this. This is a direct pass to the cluster admin. So notice that little red triangle, that means a bad day whenever you see a, a red triangle. Whenever you're doing a penetration test and you break into that first system, the first thing that you do is say, what does the world look like? I have no idea. Where am I going? I'm running scanning tools. I'm just throwing packets everywhere. Well, in a distributed system where everything's based on APIs, that enumeration is just a couple of curl commands now. If I hit C Advisor, Heapster, Kubelet, Prometheus's Node Exporter, Kube State Metrics, any of those, and it's just like, tell me about yourself. Well, here, here's everything about myself and what they're named and where they're running and what their pod hashes are. Everything is right there. So that leads me to my first demo. Because we have kube control, because we have that access, um, we can list the nodes and we can see the IP address of one of the nodes. And C Advisor runs on 4194, and if you hit the metrics endpoint, C Advisor will happily tell you everything about what's running on this system, including pod names, which are always randomized, the namespace they're in, and the container names, and the versions, the SHA hashes, basically everything that I'm running. There's my Redis. We'll get to that guy later. This one I think is fairly well known, but it's incredibly important. Um, the default service count token, if that's located in this directory, it's auto-mounted in a lot of clusters. Specifically before RBAC, this is a really big deal. If you have RBAC enabled, we'll get to some of that. Uh, but if you can run kubectl, kubectl, sorry, I was corrected this morning in the keynote. Kubectl, you can get, get pods, get secrets, uh, and your cluster admin. Again, red triangle, bad day. So we can install some tools. Download the kube control binary, validate, we can hit the API. Yes, we have the service account token mounted. We can get pods, list all the secrets, look for the good ones, and dump those contents. So four, five curl commands, and we've escalated. Next thing we want to look at, uh, the Kubernetes dashboard. Raise your hands if you run the Kubernetes dashboard. Awesome. Are you running 1.7 or higher version of the dashboard? Yeah, okay, all right. So, as you know, there's no authentication on it. It needs protection, all right? So, if you're in this vulnerable app pod here, most often you can just hit it by its service name. You don't even know, need to know what the IP address is, right? Well, that's kind of tough. How do I hit that? It's, it's a curl command. It's a big dashboard. Um, we can forward a port over SSH. That's really two commands away. So, yes, we're inside Kubernetes. Let me get the service, yep, the, the dashboard's there. Let me get the IP address by pinging it. That's a cheap way to do it without having dig installed. Um, and then we're gonna SSH out to my bad IP, that's my attacking system, say remote port 8000, funnel it on down into the dashboard. So on that remote attacking host, you go to localhost 8000, and the dashboard is in front of you. What about tampering with other services inside the cluster? Um, as you can see, there's a vote and a Redis uh, the Azure Vote front and Azure Vote back application. Um, it's a very simple Python app with a Redis back. You can vote for cats or dogs, right? Hack the vote. We're going to tamper with it. I grew up with cats, so I'm going to pick on cats today. So we're going to get the service, Azure Vote back, get its IP. Yep, port 6379 is open. Let's install the Redis CLI. Can we connect to it? Yep, we can. Dump the keys. I like cats being 1,000, let's set cats to 1,000, and let's go hit that web front page. I apologize it's in curl, but it'll be, you'll see it at the very bottom there, cats is 1,000, dogs is six, right? Take that and extrapolate that to any unauthenticated service inside the back end of your cluster, right? Redis I just picked on because it's simple and straightforward to demonstrate. Here we get a little bit more interesting, the kubelet exploit. How many of you have heard of this attack method, the kubelet exploit? Well, it's basically not an exploit. That's why it's kind of in air quotes. Uh, Kubelet the Kubelet API allows this. Uh, and in clusters without certain settings on the Kubelet will allow anybody to connect to this endpoint and exec into containers, ask for logs, um, and do other nefarious things. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask the Kubelet to run a command in a given container on it. So by one curl command, we can say, 
hey, I want you to exec, you know, list this directory inside that pod right there running on that node. So we get the, the node IPs right here. Port 10250, that's the read write kubelet API port. 10255 is the read only metrics port, right? When we hit the, the, the method running pods, we're gonna cat it out into a file so that it's easier to look at. It's a nice JSON object, again, very much like C Advisor. It's everything that I'm running. On the kubelet, this is all I know and what I'm running, complete with the hashes, the namespace, the pod name, and the container name, which is important for the next command. John, you got the Azure vote front. That's the one we're gonna pick on. So we're gonna look at the web directory of the Azure vote front app. Run is the action, default is the namespace, Azure vote front. Numbers, that's the pod name, and then the container name, and you just say, hey, run the command, list this root directory. App looks like an interesting directory. Let's look in there. Main.py looks interesting. We've just extracted the source code for this super sensitive application. Okay. Accessing etcd service directly. Um, most clusters don't expose etcd to the workers, but some install a separate etcd instance to support Calico or network policy backending. Um, and some, in some cases, that's also exposed with no, no TLS or authentication or authorization. So in this case, you may be able to defeat the system that is storing your network policies, saying, you know what, if there are network policies, but you can hit this etcd endpoint, you can go in there and say, Calico, forget about all your network policies, and Calico will happily remove all the network policies from your nodes in your cluster. This is pretty rare, but I'll get to the, the frequency of this one. Now, any of those methods that I showed about getting a kubelet or a service account token will let you possibly schedule a pod that mounts the host file system, add your own SSH key, and then SSH into it. Now we're getting into the multi-step parts here. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the external, um, sorry, we're gonna get the, the node name as it's represented inside of Kubernetes, the external IP address of that node so we can SSH into it later, create a very simple pod specification. I pick on Nginx because it's based on Debian, but we make sure it's privileged is true and we mount the root file path. <coughs> Here's what it looks like with the node selector in there so that gets scheduled on that one single node. We run it, we exec into it, we root into the slash root file system bit, and now we're on the host as root, add our own SSH key, back on out, and then SSH directly in. So if you're root and you're able to run Docker containers under the hood that Kubernetes doesn't know about, run backdoors and solve things, it's, um, it's a pretty bad day. The last classification of taxa I want to talk about is, is accessing the metadata API. Who's heard of the 169.254, 169.254, okay? We know what that is. Um, one of the things that uh, it does is gives instance data about itself, what region it's in, um, it's bootstrapping information. That often, in some of these installers' uh, cases, has sensitive S3 paths or kube ADM join tokens, right? So right then and there, that's a bad day. But also, most of these cluster installations will provide IAM instance roles attached to the workers and the masters with per permissions. Also available via that metadata API uh, are those AWS keys. They rotate every few hours, but they're just a curl command away. So let's curl those and get those. From that vulnerable pod that we talked about, we run one command, and we get uh, keys that are valid for a couple hours. We export those into our local shell in our attacking system, right? And then we have the permissions that are available to those, those keys. So describe instances, you know, list me all the instances in your entire account, not just your cluster, everything in that AWS account. And describe the instance attribute called user data on every single instance in your entire cloud account. How many of you have sensitive things in your user data in things that are not Kubernetes, maybe, possibly? That's why this blast radius is, is pretty bad, because you might not compromise your Kubernetes cluster, but that web server there that bootstraps that has a GitHub key or something in it that might be delivered via user data, you can reach over and go grab that. So that's a bad day for the other administrators. When I talk about IAM permissions, the masters and the workers typically have something that looks like this. Describe star for the worker, masters have EC2 star. 
ECR ability to pull images from, from AWS ECR and some S3 capabilities, but we really want that EC2 star, don't we? That means any AWS EC2 command is available to us. So how would we get that? We need to make sure that curl originates from the master. So there's a couple ways of doing it, compromising an existing pod running on the master. It's kind of tough. Or using one of those two issues that we just talked about, if you find a service account token, just asking the API server or just ask the kublet running on the master to run a command for you inside of a pod. So it looks like this, basically wrapping a curl command this way or this way. Notice how close they are. It's basically the same thing, just asking somebody different to do it. And the final example of why this is a bad day, if you have EC2 star, you can create a new VPC, create a new security group, create a new, SS, uh, new SSH key, create a new instance, and snapshot every volume from every single instance in your entire cloud account and then go ahead and mount it on that instance. So that can be automated as you can imagine within five or 10 minutes, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty bad day. So if you're also on the master, you then might be able to, in some cases based on the installation by default, list everything in AWS S3. Who stores logs and sensitive backups in S3? It's a bad day. <clears throat> So attacks nine and 10, I'm switching gears. I'm now talking about GKE and GCE. In GKE specifically, there's an attribute, much like the user data endpoint on the API, there's an attribute called kubenv, and that's what the kubelet uses to bootstrap itself. It gets its keys from it. That's often reachable directly. Oops, just clicked, there we go. So here's that listing. Um, Part of the security feature is though you have to pass a header into Google's um, API to make sure that you're doing it um, not through a server-side request forgery. But uh, configure sh looks interesting, kubenv looks interesting, user data looks interesting. So we can go poke at those. Uh, this reference is the kubenv. So right there, you can see there's a lot of good stuff. We know what the release is, we know where it's getting things from, we know what the IPs of the master are, but we can see that Here's the, kub, the, the kublet's information on where it gets its key, cert, and CA pen, right? This wall of text is what I call the one shot. So if you get a shell on the container inside of GKE, you can become the kublet in this one shot, awesome bash uh, hunk of, of junk here. Create, uh, pull down a kube control, grab the kube ENV from the metadata API, strip out the parts, base64 decode them into the kubelet's uh, authentication tokens, and then run kube control to list all the pods and all the namespaces. Boom. So, one of the things of note is you want to probably get the secrets, right? Well, the kubelet doesn't have the ability to go list all the secrets, but it can pull a secret if it knows its name. Well, the best way to get that is to output all of the get pods in YAML or a pod that you know of specifically and I did the dashboard here because I know it's got the cluster admin token. You can say, hey, dump the, the pod spec in YAML and it will tell you the mounted secret by its name. So now you know what that is. You can go get that secret directly. And in this case, it's the default service account token in the kube system namespace. So what we're gonna do with that is the same thing. I'm actually gonna skip this part for the sake of speed. Um, mount a host file system add SSH and SSH in. The second method through the GKE and GCE metadata API is just like an EC2, um, assigning permissions to instances, uh, GKE does the same thing. They give you an IAM token and they give you instance scopes. And that IAM token lets you talk to the Google API, the, meta, the compute API, and run actions on things inside the scope of that project. And one of those things that you can do is enumerate all the instances, of course, but you can also use this really handy dandy API method <laughs> called add SSH key. So if you have these privileges and you have this token, you're able to be on worker one, call for the token, go hit the API saying, hey, add my SSH key to worker two. And Google will happily do that if you're authenticated. And then you can SSH into worker two or anything inside that scope of that project. So if you're running multiple clusters, that means any of those nodes and all the clusters in that same project. 
So we're going to get the external IP so we know what to SSH into when we're done. We're going to basically uh, list the instances in the project. Okay. We're going to page through it a little bit just so you can see how much informa information is here. A lot of good stuff. IP addresses, external NATs and things. <clears throat> the user data, the kubenv for all the instances inside the project, right? You're doing an AWS EC2 describe instances, that equivalent inside of Google as well, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and do that same thing, but describe instance. I'm gonna see everything about this one node so I can get its fingerprint, which is needed for this API call I'm about to form. And forgive me, I use curl and bash to keep it simple. So it makes it a little bit ugly, but you don't need to download any extra tools. There's no malware running here. It's all curl and bash and, and, su and such. So what we do is we make a post body with that fingerprint that we just pulled, add my SSH key, as you can see, the public key. And we're gonna post it to that API. I'm gonna show you what it looks like rendered. That's what the final post body looks like. Here, Google, go add me to worker two. Okay, happily does it. <clears throat> and we're root on that second node. Again, a bad day. Okay. Docker PS. <coughs> How prevalent are these issues? This is what compelled me to do this talk. And I wanna stress something. This is not the entire security posture of every one of these clusters. This is a narrow band of these items that I've identified here. It doesn't say anything about the rest of them. These specific versions, the ones that I tested, note those versions. I started testing in August and September, okay? We'll get to what the latest releases look like. So it's prevalent, right? You, you would admit that it's, it's not uh, uncommon. So don't despair. We can do it. We have the technology. Attack seven through 10. If you're running an AWS, I recommend what's called a metadata proxy, something that makes sure that when you go to 169.254, that you're allowed as a pod. Kubed IM or KIM uh, both worked in my testing to, to, uh, to make sure that in AWS you're taken care of. <coughs> Excuse me. The GCE metadata proxy and these steps, and I apologize, the word these steps is actually masking Google's uh, GK hardening blog post that was released very recently. That is an incredibly important link. Uh, I apologize, that was a late addition. Uh, that is in really useful for blocking those attacks that I just showed, right? And if you're running network policy on 1.8, that is also a valid method, egress blocking. And if you're running older versions of Kubernetes like I was, and you're using Calico, you can use Calico CTL under the hood to get that same effectiveness. It's not through the Kubernetes API, but you can do it. Protect the kubelet. Authorization mode webhook. If you don't see that, um, that's your kubelet is probably allowing that kubelet exploit bit. Isolating workloads. Remember that, that hack the vote there, change it to cats? A very simple network policy literally stops that in its tracks. You say, every pod that the, has the label Azure vote back, make sure that it only gets ingress from Azure vote front. <coughs> Excuse me. This is almost a 99% perfect drop in if you're running the dashboard and you have network policy ingress support. Drop this in and it will protect your dashboard. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a bit of a trick. So we have the pod selector that says the Kubernetes dashboard only, but there's no rules. So by default, that means a default deny. This does not block kube control proxy. That works through the API server. This is from blocking from pods, which have no business talking to the dashboard. Restricting the default service account token, node and RBAC and node restriction. And I wanna stress something. You have to exec into pods and verify this, right? It's very easy to miss this or do this incorrectly if you're messing with RBAC. <coughs> and monitor all RBAC audit failures. You either have a misconfiguration of your app or somebody's attacking you and they're failing. <coughs> and I'm happy to say in 1.8 and above supporting egress natively, this policy works in your clusters as a really nice default deny platform. Apply this to every single one of your namespaces, which says ingress and egress, nothing is allowed by default in this namespace, nothing, except kubeDNS lookups to start. 
put this down as a cluster administrator, and then deploy your network policy for your workloads with your workload lifecycle. So when you're deploying Azure Vote front and back, apply the network policy that allows those two to work together at that time. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm happy to say that throughout these last five months, I've worked with every single one of these projects directly disclosing the issues that I found. A lot of cases, they were already in progress, already in flight fixing them. Um, but with newer releases and Kubernetes 1.8 and a little bit of elbow grease, we can look like this. We can literally wipe out this classification of vulnerabilities for good and make the infrastructure nice and boring. <clears throat> Two tools I want to tell you about, kubeatf. It was a tool that I wrote to help automate the creation and validation and destruction of all these clusters in a sane way. Because I spun them up every day for two hours and threw them away. I kept going through all of them. <coughs> Excuse me. And Heptio Sonobui. I wrote a plugin. It was basically a proof of concept. There's so much more you can do with this. I currently run a CIS benchmark using Aqua Security's KubeBench. So by deploying this plugin into Sonobui, we can continually scan our nodes for, for posture assessment in a very sane way. <clears throat> so even more security hardening tips. This is where it goes above that line on that apple tree I showed you. This is where it gets a little bit more advanced. Let's assume that you've all done all the things that I just suggested. Here's what you want to look for. You want to verify that all your settings are properly enforced. I can't tell you how many times I thought I hardened something and I go validate it and I didn't do it just correctly. I didn't get that label just right, et cetera. It's important that you validate those. Keep up with the latest versions if you possibly can because they're adding useful security features in every dot release. Audit all the, the, the levels that you can, the OS, the runtime, and Kubernetes. I like the, the CIS benchmarks. <coughs> Log everything outside the cluster. That's important. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Practice safe image security. There's all sorts of good um, talks and blog posts about this and tools that help with that. I already covered the Kubernetes components a bit, but the network security policy bit is incredibly important now that we have ingress and egress. Use that to your advantage. You can mask a lot of attacks by just not having network access. Okay? Protect your workloads by default by saying no ingress and egress and then apply what you're allowed to. It's, it's whitelisting, not block listing. And I added this uh, the other day, considering a service mesh. There's a lot of benefits other than all the things that it does for your application and visibility and mutual TLS, but it makes your workloads um, more isolated when they talk to each other, just by default and how it works. <coughs> I think some folks have talked about this before, but namespaces per tenant is really good when you combine it with that default uh, deny policy set. Right? If you have microservice here, microservice here, and microservice here, if they're all default denies. By default, the microservices can't talk to each other until you allow them. Right? You can be explicit. This is something we learned from the capture the flag exercise. Make sure that CPU and RAM limits are on all containers, and I know disk and network are somewhere down the line, um, to prevent malicious actors from just filling the disk or consuming all sorts of RAM with, uh, with all sorts of tools. Um, Something that people don't talk about, which I think is kind of interesting, is on your pod specs, if you're running a pod that has no business talking to the API server, in your pod spec, don't mount the service account token. You don't need it, don't put it there. Even if it's got no permissions, right? Defense in depth. And use a pod security policy to enforce container restrictions and protect the node. That's something that's gonna mature over the next few releases. And uh, shout out to some of the vendors that I talked to. This is uh, kind of an important um, note. The container where malicious activity and be behavioral detection capabilities, that's incredibly important for stopping the initial attack right where it started. At the syscall level, a shell cannot happen. A curl cannot be downloaded. It cannot be exact, et cetera. You stop it, it tracks right then and there. Um, number three in the miscellaneous security bit, separate cloud accounts projects or resources groups for different workloads or different clusters. I think a one-to-one -one mapping is safe for now. Um, it's just too, there's too many ways to hop across. And don't run dev and test workloads and clusters at the same time as production or in the same place as production, again, because there's so much opportunity for crossover. <coughs> 
And then depending on your uh, regulatory requirements, separate node pools for separate workloads using annotations to make sure sensitive stuff happens here, non-sensitive stuff happens over here. Here's some of the tools that I came across that I found of note that you might want to take advantage of when you're looking at um, auditing. The CIS benchmark has been updated from 1.8. Um, it's a great resource. KuBench implements it nicely, very straightforward to run. Um, the CIS OS and runtime hardening uh, stuff from DevSec and Ansible hardening from Major Hayden and uh, the other folks from OpenStack um, are really good at making sure the underlying postures on your systems are great. Uh, and then Kube Audit, which I'm looking forward to, I think that's the next talk. Uh, and Sona Bowie. I think there's a lot of room for growth here in this space. Notable security features in 1.8. Network policy and pod security policy whitelisting. Uh, the egress is huge. The volume mount whitelisting prevents a lot of those uh, node access bits that I was just showing you. So in closing, as a community, we're all responsible for that safety and security applications that power our world. Let's make that foundation secure by default and incredibly boring. Thank you. Okay, first I'm gonna say thanks to all those folks that I listed on the left there and now I can take some questions. Anyone? Have you played with uh, kube admin for deployment? Yes, yeah, some of those installers implement kube, kube ADM, kube admin. Um, it's, it's the join token, you gotta protect that. And then there's a lot of good stuff that happens. Yes, yes, Cert certificate rotation expiration, yep. Yes, sir? Of all the security recommendations you made, which one do you think is like the most important? I mean, I've, even, just, even just talking like the pod spec, I, I actually wasn't aware that you could say auto mount the security token, uh, the security token is false, right, which is great. Um, but is there one in particular attack vector that you think you should really focus on? Uh, the question is, what's the, what's the number one? Um, all of the above? Uh, but if the first thing is enabling RBAC, a huge classification of those things don't happen in a properly configured RBAC enabled cluster, right? And then the rest still you have to do because notice how all the things that I was doing required no special tools. Um, it was just access that you have. So combining that with network policy, just it shuts off everything to start. You might, you might have a vulnerable kubelet, right? The kubelet exploit, but if you have an egress policy, you can stop that network access, assuming you put it under every namespace, right? So you can, you can mitigate and work around without having to fix the underlying things with some, some clever policies. Yes, sir. I knew that question would happen. Did I look at OpenShift? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, I wanted to focus on vanilla Kubernetes because as you know, OpenShift is a slightly opinionated distribution of Kubernetes. The only thing that applies to OpenShift from the things that I talked about by default uh, is the metadata API. However, they don't put anything sensitive in user data and they don't put any uh, IAM um, credentials associated with those workers by default that you would get that. If you go ahead and do that, then that's available and they'll need the, the metadata proxies, but that's the only thing. I, I hesitated in, lumping it in there because it's such a different beast compared to how all these were lined up. It's a little bit of an unfair comparison, but I would highly recommend you look at OpenShift uh, in terms of uh, at least a reference point for their, their security model. Uh, it's a, without plugging, I have no horse in the race. All right, I'll be in the hallway if you have any questions. Thanks so much. <laughs>